Welcome to this episode of the ISF Podcast from the Information Security Forum, the leading authority on cyber, information security, and risk management. I'm Tavia Gilbert, and I'm glad to welcome you back to another cutting-edge conversation tailored to CISOs, CTOs, CROs, and other global security pros. In every episode of ISF's media, CEO Steve Durbin speaks with rule breakers, collaborators, culture builders, and business creatives who manage their enterprises with vision, transparency, authenticity, and integrity. And he brings that conversation to you, your teams, and your partners. Today we bring you the podcast version of a video Steve recorded with Dame Inga Beal, the former CEO and the first female CEO of Lloyd's of London. In today's conversation, Steve and Dame Inga discuss the role that listening played when she assumed leadership of Lloyd's, the courage and effectiveness of simplicity in communication, a new style of leadership built on trust, career advice for both board members and security professionals relatively new to the industry, and more. Inga, it's very nice to see you. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. You were the first female CEO at Lloyd's of London, the first in its 328 years history. Tell us a little bit about that. What were the challenges of taking on that kind of position? I mean, it sounds, well, (laughs) for most people watching, I think that's a real tall order. Well, Lloyd's is a very unique place and it has a very special part to play in British history, if you like, having been around for so long. And it's totally unique in the world. It's the only place where you can buy really, really specialist insurance. And it's been around, as you said, for over three centuries, but it hadn't modernised itself it was still doing business in the same way that it had been doing it in the 17th century. So I was basically asked to come in and introduce technology. And several of my predecessors, their attempts over several decades and millions of pounds later, their attempts had failed in the past. So my challenge was, right, I've got to do this. I can't do a big bang. I'm not allowed to close this live marketplace where people, thousands of people meet every day. I've got to keep that going, but I've got to change the way of working and introduce technology and move them away from paper. So it was an enormous challenge, but the one I didn't anticipate so much was actually the culture change that was required because the technology in a way is the easy piece There were a few choices, several different platforms, systems you could use. The technology was there, but you had to get the people to want to do it, to change the way they were working. And that was one of the challenges that I underestimated until I got the role. So tell us a bit about how you went about doing that. Well, first of all, I listened and listened and listened. I had to work out why all the previous attempts had failed. Mm. So I spoke Personally, I spoke to hundreds of people in the market. And what's so unique about this role is that you're the CEO of Lloyd's, but you have about a thousand employees, but you've got multiples of that, of people working for hundreds of other firms that are using the market. You need them to change, but because they're not your employees, you can't tell them. So I needed to try and unravel and work out why the previous attempts to introduce technology had failed which is why I spent a lot of personal time talking. And I realized it was because we hadn't been including them. They weren't involved in designing their own future. They didn't necessarily know why we were insisting on this change. We, they couldn't see the benefit for them. They couldn't see the threats or understand the threats because we hadn't laid it out and we hadn't involved them in designing their own future. So that was what we did. And while I centrally had a firm of consultants assisting to design the the vision for the future, to build a wonderful blueprint for the future. Then we started engaging with thousands of people so that actually we crafted what they wanted. So it's really about enabling change, isn't it, across an organisation? And one of the parallels that, that strikes me immediately is the sort of change that security is having to go through at the moment. I mean, for a very long time, security hasn't been considered to be integral in the business. It's been something else that has been done possibly by the IT department in certain instances. And I think perhaps a number of people listening to this will be wondering, well, you know, are there any tips that we can take from what you did in that organisation across into the security 
environment around sort of culture change, around innovation, about engagement of people in the overall process. What advice would you give for security or indeed business leaders who want to enable fairly large scale change programs post pandemic, hopefully post pandemic, um, <laughs> for however long it goes on, and certainly in the midst of recession, because that's the other big thing that's coming, isn't it? Yeah, and I mean, leaders today, it's such a complex world and there are so many threats, so many challenges out there. You know, it's difficult to know which direction to go in sometimes. But fundamentally, in my view, this is all about getting the right voices around the table. Now, when I started at Lloyd's, I realized that there had been quite a few silos built up. So people weren't talking very much to each other. And something like security, most of the people would think, oh, well, it's over there. It's their problem. It's not my problem. Where, of course, security, just like many of these other issues, is everyone's problem. And everyone needs to have a certain understanding and they need to feel a certain responsibility for it. So breaking down those silos is a big part of getting a change program to be successful. And the way we did it was that we got people talking to each other. Right. So we forced interaction amongst groups of people who wouldn't necessarily talk to each other. And I think what I get particularly worried about these days is that with technology having developed the way it has, a lot of us listen less to people who have different ideas to us. If you think about our news feeds and things, we're selecting our news feeds because actually that person irritates me. So I'm not going to get his news feed or her news feed anymore. I'm going to cut them out of my life. And so we quite a serious situation, I think, globally, particularly to get through this pandemic and to think about the recession that could be out there, the economic challenge. We've got to start talking to people who are not like us because we can't operate in these vacuums. And I think that's true for business driving change and for any business trying to navigate through the challenges ahead. I think one of the questions I'm very often asked in the work that I do with boards and with senior security leaders is how do we become more effective at gaining the attention of the people that matter? And when they say that, they're typically talking about the chief executive, the board of directors, because it all starts from the top. That's where the mood of the organization, the culture of the organization is set. And I think that for a long while, security people have struggled to speak the right language, if I could put it that way, and to get the message across. How can they be more effective? What are the sorts of tips that you would offer to them? Anyone who's got a deep expertise can sometimes struggle to get their message communicated to somebody who's not got that same level of expertise. You know, I worked in the world of insurance for 38 years and we had many very, very specialist people. And actuaries are famous for this. They do all the statistics and maths and they calculate everything. Very few of them would end up being the leader or the CEO of a business because they weren't necessarily able to communicate in a simple way. So the art of communication gets you a long way. And often people think complexity will make them look good. So they'll build a complex message. They'll almost want to show how good or smart or intelligent they are. Whereas actually, it's the simplification of that message and it's showing how simple things can be. That to me has been the reason why we managed to make our transformation successful and get the attention of the CEOs in the market because we didn't use this complicated language. We actually made it as simple as possible, partly because you've got to keep repeating it. Mm -hmm. And if you make it too complex, people, you know, they roll their eyes, they're, you know, you can't keep their attention. And I think you've got to get a nice, simple message. You've got to show that you're listening. And I've been in many boardrooms now, board meetings. I've been actually one of the executives presenting to the board. I've been a member of the board as a non-executive, listening to the executives present. And often there's a breakdown in that communication, literally in a meeting. And that can be a physical meeting or now, obviously, usually virtual. Mm -hmm. Because the board member will ask a question and often the executive gets defensive because they think actually it's a sort of attack or a doubt on their ability. And very often it isn't. Actually, the board member just wants to understand and trusts the executives generally and wants the reassurance from the executive that you've actually got things under control. But don't bamboozle with lots of scientific facts. Keep the message simple and in a language that they will understand.
And I think just flipping that, I had a question just the other day from a board that I was talking to, and the chairman said to me, you know, Steve, we're not technology people. We don't understand some of these things. How do we stay current? How can we upskill ourselves? What would be your advice there to board colleagues who are perhaps asking themselves that question? Well, I would definitely not go and start reading very technical papers and publications and things. <laughs> I really wouldn't. I think the best thing is to go to some of the mainstream media and you know, register and get news feeds focused on those topics. I mean, that's personally what I do and that's how I've, although when it comes to some of the technology, I've been driving some of it, I'm not familiar with the technology that's actually being used at all. Yeah. But what I do understand is what that impact is then for the business and what that means for a business and the vulnerabilities that it means for a business and of course the opportunities. But I tend to go for the more mainstream media, I mean, usually pretty well-respected media, mm -hmm but that then translates it for you into normal business speak. And that's what I find is the best, unless you want to become somebody who's very tech fluent. <laughs>
which is why they got me on to starting to use social media. Mm -hmm. They said, we've got to use Instagram. You know, so I said, yeah, OK. And then Snapchat. And, oh, actually, I really didn't get on with Snapchat. But I did try to, and I tried to show myself as a human, try to show my personality, because that's what this generation want, the new generation that you need to encourage to come into the security sector. They need to see you as humans and people that they can identify and relate to. And it's all about getting those stories out and being as human as possible. That's quite tricky, though, isn't it? I mean, if you take a lot of leaders today, they're of, of a certain age, if I put it that way. And what you're suggesting is that these people open themselves up to a huge amount of what might be perceived as vulnerability mm -hmm. because they have to share and they're not used to doing that. What advice would you give them? I mean, is there benefit to it that you could really sort of point to that sort of says, well, you know, take this leap of faith and you will see X, Y, Z happen? Or how do we encourage it? There is a definite move, I think, towards a different type of leader. And it's almost the power of the people saying, we don't trust you unless we know that you're not perfect, you're not invincible. Mm -hmm. Because so much corporate blah, blah has been... You know, it's the usual way. We all have wonderful corporate communications departments. And, of course, we need them. And we need to control communication to a certain extent. But it's so sort of sanitized and manufactured. And people can see through that and they're fed up with it. So leaders need to understand that these days, actually, you are much more likely to get trust, loyalty, followers if you show some vulnerability. And as the CEO, it can be very difficult sometimes to admit you got something wrong. It can be very difficult to admit you're anxious about something. But if you come out and declare that, you usually see huge benefits. Mm -hmm. People like it. They want to see you as being really authentic and genuine. And to show that vulnerability can be a wonderful leadership trait these days. And I, I don't know, it probably has changed over the years. I don't think years ago I would have wanted my CEO to show that vulnerability. But now I enjoy showing my vulnerability and the response so that that sort of feeling you get back from your employees is tremendous and therefore a huge business benefit. I want to touch on another quite sensitive topic and security is a very high stress profession. It has highs and lows, places enormous strains on mental health but it isn't something that we tend to talk about we tend to sort of brush it away. I suppose it's still a sort of harping back to, well, you know, just work through it and everything will be okay. But again, I see similarities with the insurance sector from that point of view. Any views on how to deal with that mental health issue, particularly at the moment, I think, during pandemic, where people are working remotely, they could be on their own for weeks, months on end, just looking down a webcam. So, any insights you've got on that and views? Yeah, and mental health is really a serious issue. It keeps many people away from work and huge, for some people, stigma attached to it still. An unwillingness to talk about it, a fear that if you show any sign of weakness in the work environment, that this will come back to bite you somehow. What we did in the insurance sector, we launched a diversity and inclusion festival. We launched it in 2015. It's called Dive In, Dive In Festival. And it was just in London in the first year. And we were talking about gender equality. We were talking about race topics. We weren't really talking that much about mental health then. But the next year, we realized mental health had to be on the agenda. And it's now global, this festival. It runs every year. We've got thousands of people in loads of countries around the world, countries where you wouldn't even have imagined this year we were talking about gender equality in Nigeria and things like that. It's quite incredible. But when we said we've got to get onto this mental health topic, we actively sought out somebody who was willing to record a little video and talk about their experience of when they tried to kill themselves. Nobody at work knew about this before. Mm -hmm. We got them to record it. That was the most watched Video had the most likes, the most support out of almost everything that year. But still, it's difficult to get people to talk about it. On International Men's Day, we realize that it often is affecting men more. So men feel perhaps a little more reluctant than women to talk about these things. So on International Men's Day, we got a rugby player to come in. We held a session on mental health for men. Rugby player kicks it off. We thought we'll get an audience of nearly all men because we've got him there. 
audience was still 60% women. At a, a special event for men, talking about mental health on International Men's Day. So I know how difficult it can be to get people to even come to sessions to listen to experiences and talk about it. And that's when you can have the benefit of allies. Mm -hmm. So allies, people who people can buddy with and feel comfortable with, and you know, that whole allyship, have employee resource groups focus particularly on mental health. I mean, that's what we had. We had an employee resource group that was looking at mental health. They had lots of sessions. They had lots of conversations. You've just got to get people feeling comfortable and having conversations that they don't necessarily feel comfortable about. And of course, there can be no, absolutely no repercussions. Hmm. The employer all the leaders have to understand that this is an important topic and that people can get through it just like any other illness. I think one of the things that I struggle with at the moment in listening to you and, and also thinking about how you know I go about trying to implement some of those things across my business is a lot of what you've mentioned is enabled by people getting together physically. And of course, we can't do that at the moment. So many people are having to work away from each other. Um, what are the sorts of things that we might be able to do to do a better job of perhaps enabling some of that environment, even though it's remote? Well, a lot of what we did actually was using digital already. So the recording the videos, the making it global, our dive-in festival was happening in so many countries. We didn't want it to be exclusive to a certain country. So way before the pandemic came and limited social contact, we were already wanting to make sure it was as inclusive as possible. And therefore we had things online, we streamed things, we had things happening online. Now, I think what happens is because you're, particularly if you've not been used to working in a virtual world, if you've been used to very physical environments and you're used to that water cooler or you know coffee machine chatter, and you hear little snippets and you sort of, you feel the pulse of things because those things aren't happening and people aren't perhaps used to feeling the pulse in other ways. You're gonna to have to find new ways, but there's no reason why you can't have the informal chats over whatever tech platform you're using. And they are not for work. They are just for chatting, mm -hmm. getting, you know, coffee conversations or whatever. We call them, you know, your virtual coffee meeting, whatever it is. I mean, absolutely. I think technology can close those gaps that might have formed because of the pandemic. And the role of the leader within any organisation, of course, is to promote those sorts of things, isn't it? it mm. It's to really make it part of the way that we do business, I would say. Would you agree with that? I would. It's, it's absolutely the user's responsibility. And what I've noticed, and what I hope doesn't go away post-pandemic, is that because a lot of people have been joining by video from their homes, they've been revealing a certain element of their life, mm. unless they're using something that hides the background, and people have enjoyed that. And somehow it's leveled people. Mm -hmm. Often in these physical board rooms, you would find positioning of seats quite important. You know, and often I remember, you know, you're sitting in this vast boardroom and then the speakers, the presenters who were just joining for part of the meeting, they're usually shoved down at the end, right? And they're sitting. And how awkward do you feel? How second class do you feel? How... How difficult then is it for you to get your message across? Because you're not in the center, you're not able to control and command the eye contact and all of that. Well, now on this video, fundamentally, you've leveled it. Mm -hmm. You've leveled it to an extent that we never imagined. So there's actually some really good benefits to this, but leaders should play their part in encouraging others to continue to speak up, still make sure, I mean, managing a diverse team for a start is much more difficult than managing an homogenous team. And it's up to you as a leader to shut up the people who keep talking, and to make sure the people who don't talk very much are pulled into the conversation. Now that's been an art to management for a long, long time. It's yep. not changed. And you can actually do it quite easily or perhaps a little bit more easily now on virtual platforms because you can shut people off and open up to others. <laughs> Some really positive things to take away there from being shut up and working through pandemic. It's been an absolute pleasure. Damien Gabil, thanks very much. Oh, pleasure, thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Dame Inga as much as I have, and that you are inspired to think about ways your own organization can make space for greater diversity, for deeper listening, for more courageous vulnerability, and for the growth that will follow if you do. In our next episode, Steve speaks with Kate Montague, actress, voice coach, leadership consultant, and expert in core energetics, 
or body-led psychotherapy. Kate discusses the effectiveness in taking time to reset, what happens when you stay connected to your body and your breath, and how to take the temperature of the room when the rooms are remote. Here's a preview of Kate Montague. Business is such that we can externalize only. We'll, we get busy with other people. We get lost in the back-to-back -back meetings. We lose our creative response. This will happen. We're human. And we can get triggered and we go into survival mode. So we're controlling or we're gripping or we're forcing or we're blaming and you know criticizing and so on. So as you say, taking that space, it's similar to coming off the court in Wimbledon. You wouldn't expect the players to keep bashing it out. Those golden moments that they take to sit out, catch their breath, you know, need to come back to a deep breath more deeply than normal to feel the sensations of the body. We look forward to bringing you the full conversation. In the meantime, we invite you to tune into our catalog of video and podcast episodes, all of which you can find at securityforum.org. If you feel like today's conversation was of value, you can subscribe to the audio feed wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd be so grateful if you'd recommend us. Growing our subscriber numbers helps us reach new audiences and helps us continue to bring you these timely discussions. You can always join in the conversation on our LinkedIn page at linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash information dash security dash forum, or get in touch directly through our website, where you can also download ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like these. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Assistant producer, Katie Flood. Mix and Master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening.